it's November 5th. You're walking into the voting booth. Do you have a plan, or are you drawing a blank? I'm Andrea Dresch, government and politics reporter for the San Antonio Report, and this is our live voter guide experience, brought to you by two of your most trusted nonprofit, nonpartisan newsrooms in San Antonio, KLRN and the San Antonio Report. What we're not going to do in this special segment is tell you who to vote for. That you're on their own for. What we are going to do is make sure that you know something about the candidates. We'll share some insight on the races that we've found most interesting reporting this year, and we're going to cover the basics about how and where to vote, and hopefully leave you feeling confident when you step into the ballot box. To make all that happen, I'm going to introduce you to some of my favorite colleagues who've been following these races on their beats. Then, we're going to walk through some of the tools that we've found really helpful when preparing for the November 5th ballot. If you want to get to know the candidates in every race, from the top of the ticket to the bottom, visit our website, the San Antonio Report, to view our comprehensive 2024 voter guide. You'll find more than 90 candidate profiles from the presidential race down to county constables. In many cases, you'll be able to hear from the candidates firsthand, who filled out our questionnaire about their background and experience, and how they plan to address the most pressing issues in their communities. Aside from the presidential race, which we probably couldn't tell you any more about than you already know, Texas has an exciting U.S. Senate race this year between Republican Ted Cruz and Democrat Colin Allred and a number of congressional races that could play a role in who controls the House next year. At the state level, voters are choosing who will represent them in Austin for what's sure to be another high-stakes legislative session starting in January. Locally, the Bear County Sheriff is on the ballot this year, plus two county commissioners and the county constables. We also found the judicial races particularly interesting this year. No Republicans signed up to run for any of the district court judgeships in Bear County, but Republicans are making a play for three seats on the Fourth Court of Appeals. It covers 32 counties in the Hill Country in South Texas, and Democrats control almost all the seats on that court, but the combination of red and blue counties has made for some really close races in recent years. We definitely can't get to all those races today, so we're going to start off with some contests that every San Antonio voter will see on their ballot, which is the city charter amendments. And to do that, I've invited my colleague Iris Dimmick, senior reporter for the San Antonio Report, who's been covering various aspects of the city government here for more than 12 years. Thanks so much for being here. Hi, Andrea. So, You've covered, I think, six city charter elections in the last, uh, no, three city charter election yes. attempts in the last six years, mm -hmm. different kinds, some led by the city, some led by critics of the city. Who gets to change the city charter and why would they want to? Well, only the voters are, have the power to change the city charter. And uh, the, the charter is the city's constitution. Um, it's like the, the guiding document that the city uses um, that lays out how the city functions and how city council members are paid and how, how long their terms are. Um, it's been amended only 11 times since it was first adopted in 1951. And some of the spiciest props in recent years have to do with you know, police reform and, uh, and city manager salaries. Uh, and those are typically tri triggered by a petition, a voter initiated petition. That involves collecting thousands of signatures to get those propositions on the ballot. Um, you know, and then there are city-led changes, like in 2022, when the voters approved a house, changes to what the city can spend money on uh, through its bond programs. And that, uh, that, that led to a $150 million investment into uh, affordable housing in the city of San Antonio. Um, and that sounds maybe more vanilla, but these changes can have really, really big impactful results. Um, so in the, the 2015 changes that were made uh, established more professional salaries for council. And, and that's credited, that, has, that change has been credited with, um, with letting more people, widening the pool of people who want to serve uh, as a city council person. So what kind <clears throat> are we getting this time? Is this the spicy petition driven kind or the city driven kind? Well, it's definitely spicy, but it is the city council uh, driven kind. The mayor called a uh, charter review commission. They had a bunch of meetings, did a lot of research, um, and then the city council ultimately put them on the ballot this year. Okay, and so they've, they've noted down to six of these proposals. Which ones are getting the most attention? Uh, Prop C by far is getting the most attention this year. This would uh, eliminate the pay and tenure caps that the city manager currently has. Uh, right now, uh, his, his salary is capped at uh, 10 times the lowest paid employee, uh, city employee, and he can only serve for eight years. And voters may find this familiar because they were the ones who, 60% of the voters six years ago were the ones who put this, these caps in place. 
Ah, this was the firefighters proposal from a few years ago. Yes, Got correct. It. Yeah. Um, and so city manager Eric Walsh now is in this position. And so what would make the city think that this needs to be undone and that even voters would go for it? Well, the caps are actually aimed at the former uh, city manager, Cheryl Scully, who was making nearly half a million dollars per year. And she was in this years long battle with the police and firefighters union over their labor contract. So while these rules didn't apply to her, they immediately um, applied to city manager Eric, Eric Walsh. Uh, so when he started um, in 2019, his salary was 312,000. 312, and now it's currently 374,000. Um, and he would have to find a new job in 2027 20, if Prop C is approved. And the city would also have to find a new city manager, presumably. Correct, which lots of people do not want to have to do. <laughs> there's, a, there's a group of business leaders in San Antonio um, uh, who think someone in that position des deserves more uh, competitive salaries, like with you know, CEOs of, of companies in, in San Antonio. And uh, frankly, they like Walsh and they want him to stay. Uh, so that Renew SA pack is going to be trying to spend more than a million dollars to try and undo these caps. And typically, city managers, they, they don't really stick around for 13 years. Cheryl was a bit of an outlier um, in that regard. Uh, they typically stay as city manager from three to five, you know, maybe 10 years <laughs> at the most. Okay. Um, and so this proposition, I remember getting a ton of attention when it was going through the, city, the Charter Review Commission. It was a very emotional discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about what happened in those meetings. Yeah, uh, San Antonio is one of the poorest cities in the country. And there's certainly a group of people that say that these, these pay caps could um, improve pay equity within the city organization. Uh, the, lo the lowest paid employee would be, gets about 37K a year. And there are some wage calculators out there that say a, a living wage is more like $44,000 uh, a year. And so the firefighters who push for these changes, where are they in all of this? Yeah, they, uh, the union is not mad at Walsh. They, but they are very much opposed to Proposition C. Uh, they were on the fence for a while because they, they do like and respect um, Eric Walsh, um, but they decided to get involved because of the, you know, the principle of the matter, they would say. Uh, it's more about making sure that the city manager can't amass the same kind of power that Cheryl Scully was able to do over her tenure. Um, so voters will likely be seeing a lot of firefighters at the polls, and that will may sway a lot of voters. Um, the union has a PAC as well that could, that has a bank account of um, $900,000. $900,000, yeah. okay. Lots of money wow. involved. <laughs> okay, yeah, lots of money involved, but then an issue that ultimately impacts City Hall insiders more so than the average voter. Although San right. Antonio has the, the large city manager form of government, which means the city manager is a pretty powerful position. Mm -hmm. The city council is, is less powerful here. So it's a big job, but right. more interesting to City Hall insiders. What else is on there? Anything <laughs> transformative like the housing bond? Um, well, Prop Proposition F uh, is going to be a game changer for city council members. Uh, this would give council members uh, an additional two years of breathing room between elections, so extending a two-year term to a four, keeping it at eight years total. Um, but so instead of using all of this time and energy on campaigning every other year, um, you know, the thought is, is that they would be able to, to make meaningful changes during their four-year terms. I can't understand how they might want that. Uh, what if they're not a great council member? Well, right. On the flip side, you know, if a council person really screws up or something, um, voters would have to wait, uh, uh, you know, f till the end of their four-year term or call a recall, you know, election. But neither, that's not very fun or easy. So <laughs> Interesting. This one is kind of fascinating to me because it would mean that our next mayor, whoever is elected to replace Ron Nuremberg, would be a four-year mayor, which would be a, a, a big change mm -hmm. um, versus that person having to run for re-election in two years. Um, and what else? What else? I remember that the city council had several changes that they wanted for themselves, perhaps, yes. out of this. Yeah, they, um, the mayor and city council are also stand to gain some, some uh, monetary uh, benefits out of this election. Uh, it, it wouldn't widely shift uh, who's considering running for office, but, uh, but it might make sure that we don't have this debate again. So this would tie the annual median income for a family of four and be updated annually so that's uh, roughly 70,000 for council and 87 for for the mayor 
Um, but that's a 47 and 42 percent pay bumps. So it's, it's quite significant. Um, I guess that comes in lower than at one point we were talking six figure salaries for the council correct. during this process. And correct. that that is no longer. Yeah, there was a pretty major backlash to to suggesting, um, you know, 100, 100 or more than one hundred thousand dollars for the council members and the mayor. Um, but yeah, it's always an awkward, ugly fight when uh, you know, the elected officials have to talk about their own compensation. So um, at one, at, for perspective though, the city, the, the county commissioners do make more than $100,000. More than, more than $100,000 more than the city council members. <laughs> and, that's, and that's after they get the raise? If they were to get this raise, it'd be 100,000 more than that? Roughly, yeah. <laughs> wow, Roughly. okay, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what else, so now we've covered C, D, uh, <laughs> fun to tr keep track of, right? Yes. <laughs> a, I think A is about the um, ethics and Correct. some clarity there. Some B is some language changes, updating things in the charter. Mm -hmm. um, and this final one was, this was one that was proposed by not the city council themselves, correct? Right. Proposition D is interesting. It, it removes a restriction on political activity for city employees. Um, a vote for it would allow them to work or volunteer for municipal candidates. Um, as long as it's on their own time, off the city's clock, and not using city resources. Uh, this prop actually didn't, yeah, did not come from the review commission um, or from a petition. It was, uh, it was lobbied for by the, the union who represents city employees. You know, they showed up to those charter commission meetings and to city council meetings uh, to advocate for that, and city council agreed to put it on the ballot. Got it. So this is a lot at the bottom of a ballot. <laughs> yeah, so what is the outlook? Are people thinking that these would pass? Uh, that remains to be seen. I am, I am no longer in the betting business when it comes to city charters, <laughs> and I never was. But, um, so, but if any of them succeed, uh, it would take two, uh, we can't change the charter again for another two years. So, oh, what have fun a would that be? Yeah. This is, it's provided some really interesting politics. The Proposition A, the firefighters unions, this has yeah. been some, some interesting topics for us to cover. Agree. Be <laughs> off, the, the, off the table until May 2027? Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Iris. Iris is our in-house expert on all things city government. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate it. For our next segment, I want to talk about some other races that you might not be expecting to see on your November ballot, which is school board races. Some districts hold their board races in the spring on the municipal election ballot, but two Bear County districts will have candidates on the November ballot, and some voters will also see a race for the State Board of Education, which, if you follow Texas politics closely, is where some of the spiciest political fights play out over curriculum, textbook, charter schools, etc. To talk about all of this, I wanted to bring on the San Antonio Report's in-house education expert, Isaac Wines. Thanks for being here, Isaac. Thanks for having me. So who is holding their school board elections on the November ballot? So there is one seat that's up for election on the uh, East Central Independent School District Board. Uh, and then there are uh, a couple seats up for the Edgewood Independent School District uh, Board of Trustees as well. And where is the Edgewood relatively located in the county? Uh, it's kind of west, uh, west of uh, downtown San Antonio. Are any of these spicy races like we saw in NEISD a couple months ago? Uh, so I wouldn't say that spicy in terms of kind of partisan politics like we saw there, but definitely uh, contentious in terms of kind of, I'd say, more local politics, uh, local groups, um, and uh, I guess factions of people that are supporting other people, um, which uh, is, is something that has uh, been the case in Edgewood in the past. Elaborate. Uh, so, uh, some of the, the candidates that are being accused of this actually re reject the idea that they're, you know, being brought back to the old ways. But just for a little bit of background, Edgewood was um, taken over by the state in 2016 for factionalism, um, where there were these groups that were deadlocked on all sorts of issues. And um, really, after returning to local control, they've been a much more unified board. That was until last year, a young trustee, uh, just graduated high school, ran unopposed. Ever since then, uh, he has been really, um, you know, pushing against the grain, trying to hold, uh, you know, the administration accountable from his perspective. And um, he actually isn't running in this race, but uh, some other people that, uh, uh, you know, are inspired by him are running. And one of the long for long-standing trustees, uh, Richard Santoyo, who was actually first appointed by the state as one of those board of managers, has uh, 
shared concerns that he sees this as kind of a, a potentially going back to those old ways of factionalism. Interesting. Did the new person recruit these candidates, or are they running uh, opposing what he, the change that he brought? So uh, the uh, allegation is certainly that he recruited them. All of the candidates have denied that charge, and you know said for various reasons, um, you know that. Um, that, that they're running for their own reasons. I think there are a lot of similarities just in this idea that there isn't enough community or parent engagement, um, and then that there isn't enough accountability for the administration that has really been there since the state took over. And this district also has a, a bond on the ballot this uh, No, actually that's a, a different district that is the bond, uh, okay. East Central. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, they have a, a four, three part bond ask. Um, and that's uh, East Central, which uh, has kind of the opposite problem. Edgewood, one of the big things a lot of the candidates talked about was school closures, declining enrollment, because that's been a problem they've faced. East Central, on the other hand, is seeing rapid growth, rapid expansion. They're expected to double within the next 10 years. And so they're looking to get uh, some new schools, a new high school, two new elementary schools through those bonds, and then to fix some very old, decaying um, sports facilities uh, with another two of those pieces. I know in this area we've had a few bonds fail in recent years. What is the word on this one? Is, is it expected to pass? Uh, I, I think it's yet to be seen for sure. There uh, have been several successful bonds in this area in the past just because uh, the need is so great. You know, if you run out of space in schools, you need to build those new schools. Um, and so I think uh, kind of with that argument, um, it, it's likely to pass probably. Um, but you never know. It's always, you know, you're seeing that it's uh, increasing taxes on your, on your property bill. So um, that always has the chance of um, scaring some, some voters. Interesting. Well, we, we love a, a spicy school board race at the San Antonio Report. Um, and, and we do have one partisan school uh, education race on the ballot. This is this race for this massive district in the State Board of Education, District 1, correct? Um, it runs all the way from the west side of San Antonio to El Paso. You've got a Democrat who decided not to run for re-election at the last minute and um, two candidates who are running for this. And, and I know you interviewed mo both of them recently for a story that you worked on. What's going on in that race? Yeah, certainly. So I think uh, a lot of the education issues across the state have taken on a political flair recently. Uh, and I thought I was kind of uh, surprised by the lack of that between these two candidates. Um, there was a lot of agreement on things like uh, more scrutiny for charter schools, uh, more academic rigor, and then reforming the state standardized test. One of the issues that always comes up in these races, even though they don't directly impact it, is the school voucher debate. And uh, the Republican candidate, Michael Stevens, actually kind of broke from uh, a lot of others in his parties and, and said he was staying neutral and not going to take a hard position. Um, in 2022, when he ran before, he did kind of post and uh, say some things in support of it, but this time he, he said he was staying neutral. Interesting, that issue that has take, taken up so much oxygen in this cycle. And the Democrat in this race is uh, Gustavo Revelis, and he's on the total other side of the district. Um, what is he calling for? Yeah, so he uh, again kind of made the point that uh, the State Board of Education doesn't pass vouchers, doesn't really you know, have a stake in uh, whether it passes or not uh, in terms of actually making the decision, but said that it was important for him to take a stand against them. Uh, entirely, and so um, he, he took that position. And big picture, this um, the State Board of Education, what will they be, what do you think they will be their biggest battles in the coming year? Yeah, I think so, definitely curriculum mm -hmm. uh, changes, what, uh, you know, what is going to be taught in Texas classrooms. Um, it's already really controversial with the uh, current state-authored curriculum that is uh, being uh, considered right now, it'll be voted on next month. I think that um, considering those pieces will, will be something really big moving forward. And then just the rigor of, you know, actual academics as we look to increase, uh, you know, the, the really middling or lower rankings of Texas in the national education landscape. Fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on today, Isaac. Of course. Thank you. For our next segment, I want to make absolutely sure by the end of this show that you have a clear plan in mind for what it's going to be like when you head to the polls. 
Texas has a lot of rules and they changed often. So we wanted to run through the deadlines, what to bring, what to wear, what not to wear, what to expect, where to go. And to do all of that, I invited the San Antonio Reports reporter, Lindsay Carnett, to talk about some of her reporting on voting logistics. Lindsay, thanks for being here. Andrew, thanks for having me. All right, so give us the lay of the land. When does early voting start? Where do you early vote? What are the deadlines? What do we need to know? So most importantly in um, Texas, you need to already have been registered to vote. Uh, and that deadline was unfortunately on October 7th. So if you didn't meet that deadline, um, please get registered to vote next time, but make sure that you that's are- right. We will have a municipal election in just a few short months. <laughs> yes, that's right. And they're always coming up. So make sure you're registered for the next one. But um, if you are registered for this one, early voting starts on October 21st um, and it will go through November 1st. And so um, we have a bunch of polls here in San Antonio. We have 51 early voting locations. Uh, and you can see all of those on a map on the Bear County Elections webpage. So if you want to pop over to that and visit it, you can find the closest poll to you. Um, and you can also vote at any of those as long as you have a valid form of ID. So as long as you're carrying your valid form of ID, you can visit any of those 51 locations. I definitely suggest early voting because election day voting can be crazy lines. Um, and it can be really, really long, so. And if you do wait to election day, we've got a few more, there's like something like 300 locations instead of the 50, but um, if you do on election day, what are the rules there? You need to be in line or it's, what are the hours for election day voting, do you know? So yeah, that's a great question. For early voting, you need to check by the location, but for voting day, um, as long as you're in line by 7 p.m. at any of the valid polling locations, you will be able to vote. Okay, and also you can still, you can go to any of the 300, right? That's right, yes, you can go okay. to any of those. And Lindsay, what's on your packing list when you go to vote? So make sure that you bring one of your seven forms of valid IDs in Texas. Seven. That, there are seven, I know, yeah, it's a lot. So you can definitely bring your driver's license or your passport. Those are the most two common ones, of course, but your handgun license, your military ID, uh, your Texas elections ID, and there's one more or two more that I'm forgetting. Library but card? I'm sorry? Library card? No, no, it has to be like government specifically issued. Uh, but if you forget any of those, um, you can also submit a, a form and bring any sort of government ID that you have. Okay. And what if you've moved? Um, you can check your, I know you can check your voter registration, but if you've moved since the last election, what happens then? Yeah, that's a great question. If you've moved, um, you may still have to vote based on your old address if it is still uh, valid, but you will still get to vote. Um, and I know for a lot of people, they're excited to vote about the presidential election. Um, so you will still get to cast your vote for that. How do you know what you're going to select when you're in there? That's a great question. Um, so we do, um, we did a report recently about your specific ballot. So everybody's ballot is gonna be different um, from each other. So if I vote, Andrea, my ballot may look different than yours because I live on the north side of San Antonio. Um, you live- You got on... an exciting house race on the north yes, side. <laughs> so yeah, and so we have a different ballot, which um, because the congressional districts are really wonky in Texas, you wanna make sure to check um, your specific address beforehand. So the best way to do that is to go to the Bear County Elections webpage. They have a tool that we gave a step-by-step -step guide on the report um, on how to look up your ballot. Uh, and make sure you look at that with our voters guide so that you're able to pick out which candidates you want. But do not bring your iPhone or your tablet into the boxes. They will not allow that. Make sure you write down on paper or print out that ballot to take into the box with you who you're gonna vote for. What else? What are we missing? I know Texas has tons of rules. Yeah, make sure that when you go, um, you're not wearing any sort of candidate specific um, wear. So no buttons, no hats, no t-shirts. That's not allowed in Texas. Um, and then make sure you get there um, early. Make sure you bring your ID. All of that should be um, all you need to, to vote. Well, Lindsay, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. Covering these races and putting together the voter guide and these other election tools is truly a labor of love for us at the San Antonio Report. We, too, look at the ballot and feel overwhelmed sometimes. And it's my hope that over the course of this program, you heard about a race or a candidate or a ballot initiative that you hadn't heard about before. We've had so much fun learning about it all through our reporting, and I think you will, too. So take advantage of all the information available at our website, sign up for our newsletters, email us with your feedback. I'm Andrea Dresch, government and politics reporter for the San Antonio Report. See you on the other side of this November 5th election.
November 5th is Election Day, and KLRN reminds you, every vote counts. Early voting starts October 21st and runs through November 1st. Bear County has 51 locations where you can vote early and you can vote at any site. Want to view a sample ballot before you head to the polls? You can find your ballot online at the Bear County Elections Department website. If you need curbside voting, no worries. Just call ahead to the elections office so the early voting clerk at your voting location can be notified. What do you need to bring when you vote? Any one of seven accepted forms of ID, such as your driver's license, military ID, or your passport. And don't forget, phones are not allowed in the voting booth. Need a mail-in ballot? The elections department needs to receive your request for the ballot by October 25th. Remember, your vote counts.